Studies show that 98% of domestic violence victims also experience financial abuse from their abuser. Many victims of sexual assault, whether it's here in the United States or even around the world, stay in abusive relationships because of financial insecurity. My guest today saw that need and saw the ability to partner with women around the world to provide them a job as a means of providing an outlet so that they don't have to be trapped in abusive partnerships. Having products that are ethically made, providing jobs for women around the world, it's so much more than pretty things. For some women, it can be life-changing. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman of Still Being Molly, and this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, companies, and small businesses that are changing the world. Each week, I interview an entrepreneur, a CEO, nonprofit director, community leader, or just an incredible person who's trying to make a positive impact, not only through their personal life, but also with their career. My goal is to show you that no matter what you do for a living, you can make an impact wherever you are. My guest this week is Joy McBrien, the founder of Fair Anita, a social enterprise that's all about empowering women from all around the world through dignified jobs and fair trade relationships. Their incredibly talented artists and partners carefully design and create every single product by hand, creating gorgeous accessories that you can be proud to wear. I am a huge fan of Joy and her work. I actually got to meet her in person at the Fair Trade Federation Conference back in March of 2019, and I am such a just advocate for what she's doing, and so I was honored to have her on the show. So without further ado, on to my conversation with Joy. It's a happy day because I have Joy Joy. I mean, literally, your name means happy joy. Uh, oh, gosh. What's that? Renan's happy, happy joy, joy. OK, OK. Yep. yep. It's, it's too early. It's too early. Um, I have Joy McBrien on the show, and I'm so excited. Joy, how are you today? Doing super. How are you, Molly? I am doing fantastic. And you are someone who, I mean, obviously, if I have somebody on the show, I always want to talk to them. But you are somebody especially that don't tell them my other guests that I've just been really excited to talk with for a while. And we scheduled this like months ago. So this has been mo- like months in the making, having you yeah. on the show. Long time coming. Long time <laughs> coming. Yes. We <laughs> met in person at the Fair Trade Federation conference back in March, which was so much fun. And I am just such a huge fan of you. And you have this incredibly powerful story. I mean, you were a a TED speaker. Like, you know how that's like the millennial phrase now when people say, like, thank you for coming to my TED talk. You can say that (laughs) and you actually have done a TED talk. (laughs) Yeah, it's... (laughs) It's been a thing. Don't set expectations too high here, Molly. <laughs> I know, but there are just so many few people who can say, like, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. And, like, they've actually done a TED Talk. So, <laughs> But now I'm realizing, oh, I should say that in real life. You really should. <laughs> Joy, this is a missed opportunity for you. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It really is. is but a it's a mutual movie. feeling wanting to chat with you as well. Aww. Oh, shucks. You're so nice. Um, okay. Well, then, because you're so amazing and you've given a TED Talk, uh, give us another TED Talk. I'm just kidding. Um, but give us the Joy 101. So tell us who you are for those that are listening that are like, who is Joy McBrien and why did she give a TED Talk? Um, give us the Joy 101 and tell us all about yourself <laughs> and uh, how you got started with Fair Anita. Yeah. Thanks, Molly. Um, so I'm from Minnesota and I'm 29 years old, millennial represent. And um, <laughs> I have been passionate about ethical supply chains and women's rights for, for quite a while here. Um, I started Fair Anita when I was 24, started it because of Uh, history with rape and sexual violence. And I started doing a lot of research and I learned that financial insecurity is the main reason why women stay in abusive partnerships. Um, And so kind of from there sought out to create financial security for women with uh, histories similar to my own. 
And yeah, I had always been a hardcore nerd, still am, very much so. And so it's been a really fun journey. I get to tackle new challenges every day and really figure out how do we make a dent in this in this big issue of consumerism? How, how do we create ethical supply chains that empower women rather than exploit them? You have you really do have such a powerful story and I won't uh, have you recap all of it um, for those that want to see that for those listening that want to see Joy's TED talk you have a copy of it on the Fair Anita website um, but I will also include a link to it in the show notes um, so that people can see it because it's really really powerful um, oh, but you you briefly um, you know alluded to um, just a, a really big passion for um, combating sexual violence and um, things like that because of uh, your own story and um, I, I'm my, I'm curious at what point kind of you, I mean, you started Farinita at 24, which is amazing. I mean, not many people in their early 20s become entrepreneurs like that. Um, at what point did you because like you mentioned the correlation between um, financial security and women being able to leave abusive situations and things like that. But at what point did you say, you know what, I'm going to start an ethical jewelry brand? Like how did, um, you know, how did that kind of come into play and um, where did you begin to find, you know, artisan partners and, you know, kind of how did all of that weave itself together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually, I started my first jewelry company when I was 15. um, And so I knew how to make jewelry. And so I think it's really important when we're, um, you know, whatever we approach in life that we're our best foot forward, coming forward with our strengths. And jewelry is something that I knew, that I understood. Um, And so when I was meeting with different women around the world, um, a lot of women have their, um, like, their own tradition of jewelry making in their different cultures. And so it was something that we could, we could connect over that, uh, that we could brainstorm new designs together. And it's, it's been really fun in that way. Part of the reason I started an uh, ethical uh, jewelry and accessory company was because um, after my first experience with rape, I was living in Chimbote, Peru, which is one of the largest poorest cities in the world. And I, I witnessed what factory conditions look like there. And as a result, became really passionate about knowing where my things came from and uh, what conditions the the people making those products were in. And there's, of course, some huge leaders in the fair trade world, 10,000 villages, and serve, et cetera. Um, and they're doing phenomenal work and have set this um, really foundation for fair trade to, to grow and flourish. Um, but I didn't feel like the products were being made for me, honestly. Um, they, and, and, and they weren't. My target market um, was more, more so my mama, um, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. But I mm-hmm. wanted to find ethically made products that, that look like they were for me, you know, that look like something I would, that I would naturally wear. And that was, that was affordable for me as well, um, given a limited, a very limited budget. Um, I was in AmeriCorps at the time, so extra limited budget. Um, (laughs) and yeah, I, I couldn't find something that, uh, that I was excited about. So I started it myself and, um, so many of the women that I had met with when I was traveling around the world, they were always like, they were never looking for charity or a handout or anything. They were just looking for a job, you know, and so so often they're very, very talented women making these incredible things. And they'd be like, Hey, like, what do you think about taking this back to the U S and selling it? And my response was always kind of like, I don't know. Like, I don't have a platform to do that. It doesn't seem like a super responsible idea for me to just start doing this. But as I traveled, I built up this network of, of women doing incredible things. And then when I decided to start Farinita, I reached back out to them and I said, Hey, like, what if we partner together, um, partner together on designs as well. And so using your traditional skill sets, um, and creating designs that are made for more of a U.S. market. What if we partnered up and they were ecstatic. And so it's, it's really grown from there. You brought up a couple of points that I think are so just 
really important um, and vital topics of conversation um, in the whole ethical fair trade space. Um, And that equates to basically or boils down to uh, design and price point. And Mm -hmm. a lot of times brands, here's kind of what I have found as just an advocate, as a consumer, um, is that brands tend to either hit one or the other. (laughs) They either will have a great price point, but the design is kind of meh. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Or they'll have a great design, but the price point is out of reach for the average consumer. Yeah. And hitting those two things right, you know, like hitting them at their stride, like getting them right is so difficult. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that I remember very vividly, you and I having a conversation about at the Fair Trade Federation conference when we went around when I was going around to the different tables and I was looking at your line and I obviously I've seen your work before, but to really see it in person and be able to hold it and touch it and try it on and things like that. It's just different. Um, and I remember saying to you, I was like, I really hope you take this as a compliment, but this is the kind of jewelry that I would see in hanging in Target. Mm-hmm. And you were like, yes, absolutely. And I was like, I mean, I really mean that not that it looks mass produced or anything like that, but it's trendy. It's cute. It is something that I would wear. Like it's, I mean, people, I mean, we love, let's be honest, mm-hmm. us women, we love Target. And so like we walk around Target, we meander over to the jewelry section and like, you know, There's always like memes going around on Facebook and Instagram and things like that about how like you walk into for Target into Target for like toilet paper and you walk out with a cart that's one hundred and fifty dollars and you don't know what happened. Um, And like it always ends up being because there's something in the clothing or the jewelry or something like that. But I, I, I we talked about how it was just it was really accessible, trendy, beautiful pieces that didn't necessarily look have that look of being kind of like what you said, where you're like, it's something for my mom, like very kitschy, like handmade looks really uh, like something you bought while you were on a cruise and you like (laughs) went into a little, you know, marketplace at a port, you know, you know, you're like, I'm going to get this cool souvenir. Um, It didn't look like that. It looked really great. And then on top of that, your price points are right there in line with the same price points that you'd be paying at Target. And so we talked a lot about that and how that was something that you've really been intentional about. Um, And so I don't know if you want to just kind of expand on that a little bit um, to kind of share how that has been a process for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we're talking about ethical consumption, we have to think about ethics, um, in so many different senses of the word, right? And part of that is accessibility. I don't believe it's ethical fashion if it's only accessible to um, one subset of people, um, given its its price point or its location or whatnot. Um, and so that's that's really one of our goals with Fair Anita is how do we open up this fair trade, ethical, sustainable movement to um, to a younger demographic, to a, <laughs> a demographic with a smaller paycheck, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, so we've, we've done that by design from the beginning. And so when I work with artisan partners on our designs, a lot of our designs are ultimately determined by what the end price point is going to be too. And so if we're going to use a material that would somehow, you know, price it out of our average price point, our average retail price point is about $18. And so we do try to keep it, um, something you can like easily give a girlfriend as a gift or whatever. Um, and yeah, if it, it, it just really does heavily influence the design, the, the choices that we make there in terms of what materials are used in terms of how much time does it actually take to create the product? Because we're making sure that artisans are paid two to three times minimum wage, a livable wage, um, in their local communities. And so, um, it's, it's been a fun iterative process figuring that out, but, um, ultimately, our end game is well, the more fair trade products we're selling, the more fair trade jobs we create for women around the world. And so if we have a higher margin, that ultimately doesn't affect our our mission with women around the world. What affects the mission is the number of products that are headed out the door because 
um, because that is what is creating fair trade jobs for women. And so we've been intentional in keeping our overhead low from the beginning. We have a very small team. And um, if a pair of earrings is $12, you're more likely to buy two pairs of them, <laughs> which is which is how we create them. Yo, cool. you're so right. At the end of the day, it's like it really is all about volume. <laughs> like it's just it can, you know, when you are pushing out more product, you're able to pay more. Like it's just it, it it's kind of what is it? Supply and demand. It's all supply and demand. It's like mm-hmm. ba- basic economics 101. I am not a I am not an economics person, but I think it's like a pretty, you know, like ground level yeah. uh, <laughs> concept. But what I love that we- <laughs> about that demand is that it's being driven yes. by a millennial population. Mm-hmm. So um, Forbes had an article out, I think in 2018, that said um, 73% of millennials are more likely to purchase a mission based product um, if they're given a comparable alternative. And so comparable, I think, is the key word there. So it has to be comparable in price and design. Um, but Millennials are looking for purpose in not only the products they buy and the businesses they support, but in the in the careers that they choose as well. And so I think we've really um, been working on building up this demand and businesses are going to have to rise to to meet it. They're going to have to become more ethical as a result. I'm taking a quick break from my chat with Joy to talk about the incredible fall collection from Seiko Designs. You are going to just be so inspired by the richness of the season's colors like pebbled amore and oiled olive. Let the fall collection not only be a celebration of travel, but also a celebration of the journey within. My favorite pieces like the multi-way shawl in Leo, which I'm actually wearing right now as I speak this, (laughs) the How It's Made Matters tee, and the multi-way tunic sweater are just on repeat all season long. Versatility is my love language and these pieces are so versatile. So to shop this incredible collection, go to seikodesigns.com forward slash Molly Stillman. That's S-S-E-K-O designs.com slash Molly Stillman. Now back to my chat with Joy. This is something that I have been talking about a lot. Um, I mean, this was like what my entire fair trade keynote was. <laughs> it was just about how brands are going to have to, because of consumer demand, which is fantastic. And, you know, we're getting what we want as advocates, as brand owners, as all these, you know, as people who are passionate about this is consumer demand is increasing. And we're seeing that in the marketplace. And so, you know, sort of the the idea of a brand being fair trade and ethical is over time, like it's becoming less and less unique. It's becoming less and less special. And so we have to kind of keep up with the, I don't want to say keep up with the Joneses. That's not right. But you you know what I'm saying? Like where we're seeing, I mean, Target, I'm wearing today, right now, Target's new fair trade denim line. Like Target Uh has fair trade certified jeans and they are fantastic. And they fit great. They have them in a wide range of sizes. They're size inclusive. They need to make them for tall ladies too. Yes, they have. (laughs) That's the other thing is they're not just like, it's a great price point. It Mm -hmm. is, the fit is great. They have sizing all the way up to, I think, 20 or 22, um, which you see very, very rarely in fair trade jeans. They have short, regular, and tall lengths. I mean, they just... It's something that is now creating a fair trade market that's accessible to the average consumer. Um, And so you're going to start to see other, you know, denim lines that are ethical or fair trade. Like they're now going to have to keep up. And that's, you know, yes, it can obviously for for as a business owner, that is a problem. But at the end of the day, it's a good problem to have because that means that progress is being made. It means that we're moving forward. It means that the ethical and fair trade movement is growing. And if we want to see those values become normal and become business as usual, then we have to celebrate those wins. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that small businesses have always kind of been the innovators in these spaces, yeah. right? And then yeah. the larger businesses have followed suit. So I think it just gives us as small brands an opportunity to push that line even further, right? So like at Serenita, we are um, we're working to have all of our products made from recycled materials. Right now, we're pretty close. It's really hard to get recycled chain that doesn't break. 
Um, we're working to get all of our packaging to be biodegradable. Um, we're working to become a carbon negative organization. And I think, um, yeah, it's fantastic that Target has this kind of fair trade denim. I did buy, I did buy a pair. I'm just over six feet tall and they really look like trees on me. So I'm just like, I'm just going with it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's absolutely a starting place. Ultimately, it means that those, those genes were, were fair or sewn in a, in a, like a fair trade factory. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, the cotton was grown or the denim was, um, it, you know, produced in a sustainable way. And so there's absolutely still room to improve and room for us to, to yeah, help raise that bar. Um, and as consumers, absolutely to push brands to continue to do this. Um, but yeah, it is a humongous step. Yeah. That brands like Madewell and Target have taken that action. I love it. You're absolutely right. I mean, and it's just something that I'm really looking forward to, to continuing to see how we are able to continue growing this movement, how we are able to continue advocating for these values and how we're going to see other brands, large and small, kind of following suit. Um, and you're right, like there's always room for improvement, but the fact that you know large companies like Target, Madewell, J. Crew, Athleta, you know, Nike, that we're seeing these companies do these things, that we're seeing that this is important to them as well because they're responding to the, the consumer demand. So, yeah, it's, it's important to their customers, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Now I want their whole supply chain yeah. <laughs> to be to be more ethical. Yes. Let's work on that, Target buddies. They're in Minnesota, too, so. You should just go on over to their corporate <laughs> and be like, hey, what's up, Target? Um, I'm happy to help you. So if you need any assistance, let me know. Um, you could be like, uh, what was it? Uh, Kristen Wiig's character, the Target lady. <laughs> I, don't I don't know what the correlation yeah, we, is. We have started some of those conversations. So that's been good. But I think, I really think it's going to only continue to push in this way. I guess, um, millennials are like receiving a transfer of wealth from baby boomers, right? Like as they're taking over the job market. So they're um, going to receive like a $30 uh, trillion dollar transfer of wealth. And given that millennials and younger generations, Gen Y, Gen Z are even more so focused on sustainability. I think we're only going to see these, these companies continue to improve as a result of consumer demand. So what is on the horizon for Farinita? I mean, you just said that you kind of like been having some conversations. I don't know. But, um, you know, what is what is your dream for this company? I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, I mean, you're advocating for ethical and fair trade values. But at the end of the day, like when we really peel back the layers of the onion, like your heart and your passion is uh, freeing women from dangerous situations and um, you're really passionate about um, fighting sexual violence and domestic violence things like that um, you know what is sort of your 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 long-term dream it's always a good question it's all ever evolving you know <laughs> um, but with, with, with Sarah Nita I'm real I really am interested in helping um, larger organizations improve their I think there is just a huge opportunity in that um, and more shorter long term, we're, we're looking at how do we create more um, sustainable options for for our customers here too. Like we just we launched um, bamboo straws and utensils because I couldn't find fair trade um, bamboo straws and utensils, and it's super random because we have like exclusively jewelry and <laughs> accessories on our website. Our artisan partners can make them, and so I started off with just like 200 sets of each of them, and they sold out overnight. Um, and so now we're like, okay, like, what are other, you know, very useful things that we can uh, we can have made in there too? Personal, where, where I want to go, yeah, I'm I'm really interested in uh, international women's rights and how do we how do we change the conversation in this? Um, how how do we bring the supplier back into the conversation in the supply chain? Um, and I'm super passionate about consent in storytelling too. And I think um, mission-driven brands have have a ways to go on that. Um, ourselves included, we're we're working working pretty diligently on that to make sure. Um, yes, like we work with survivors of sexual and domestic violence, um, but we want to make sure they still own their story and they are the ones that 
choose what is what is shared about their lives and not. Um, and so a lot of times customers are asking us, you know, they want the full life stories of different artisans and, you know, whatnot. And uh, we won't give it to them. There is, we work with 8,000 women and there's, there's a few women who, yes, are super excited to share their stories and, you know, show like, this is where I came from and this is where I'm at now. Like, you know, look at me. Um, but a lot of women that we work with don't want that. They, they want people to purchase the product because they think it's well-made because they're excited to wear it, um, because it's a good price point. Um, and yeah, I'm interested in how we expand this conversation around consent um, into storytelling and other aspects of our lives. And I, I hope that we're able to help start some of those conversations with Hearing Unit. That is such an important conversation to have and topic to bring up because it's one that I don't think we talk about enough, and that is that whole you know consent and storytelling, um, and it can be applied in so many areas. Um, and you're right, the ethical and fair trade world is really guilty of this sometimes, um, of not getting proper consent in in telling someone else's story. Um, I think it happens. When we talk about anything that can be considered um, tragic or um, where there is trauma involved, Mm -hmm. it's so important that you get that consent and that you realize that this is not your story to tell. Um, If they have given you permission, if they've consented, then then sure. But I remember just a couple of months ago, like this just comes to to mind. Um, I I do a lot of anti-human trafficking work here in the area, and um, I was interviewed by a reporter for a news story um, here on a local news station about about human trafficking. And the reporter, I mean, I understand that she was just doing her job, and but she was like, "Can you tell me um, the stories of some of the victims that you've worked with?" And I was like. No, <laughs> like, no, I cannot, um, you know, and it's like, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but I'm like, no, no, I actually, I, I can't. Um, but I think that, it, you know, sometimes we try to glamorize these things or something like that yeah. and we sensationalize them. And it's like, no, 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 this is somebody, this isn't a podcast. This isn't a, you know, a true crime dateline episode This is someone's life. This is someone's experience. This is their trauma that we need to be respectful of. Um, And when they are ready to share their story and when they're ready to own their story, then then the story can be told. But until that point, the answer is no. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm pretty sick of um, news or organizations or whatever um, exploiting people's personal trauma for sales. Um, And I think it, it... shows again the idea of like the you know this danger of the the singular identity like we're all such multifaceted individuals i know that there's been articles written about me um that will say you know like rape survivor starts business to help other rape survivors and like how much that triggers my own mental health when like that is seen as my sole identity you know as opposed to you know a dancer or entrepreneur or (laughs) you know whatever that might be um it, yeah, it's 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 really difficult. It's it's been a it's been a tricky balance for us here too, um, because I also believe that violence against women we need to be talking about it more, and I think that's how we're ultimately going to um, hold perpetrators more accountable, um, help change the culture around violence against women. There isn't you know a yes or no answer to different things. I mean, in terms of consent, yes, but um, in terms of like how to move forward from these experiences. And um, yeah, it's been tricky as ultimately a a white woman running a a fair trade organization, um, putting my own story at the center of this violence against women has been pretty awkward um, because I would prefer to not do that. But at the same time, like that, that is the story that I own, that I have um, the ability to decide who gets to hear it and who doesn't. Um, And yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put other women's stories there that aren't comfortable. And so it's it's been kind of this balance of how do we keep the artisans at the center of this, um, the, the movement, and of course they're at like the heart of everything that we do as an organization. Uh, but how do we keep them the center of the storytelling as well, 
um, without exploiting their stories. You're absolutely right. And I love that you you kind of bring up that whole idea of it being kind of this tricky balance, um, because especially as a business owner, I mean, like marketing 101 is like one of the best way to market things is through the power of story. Like stories are powerful. We connect with stories. Um, I just finished rereading. Um, I read it years ago, but I hadn't read it in a while, so I wanted to um, – read it again, but I just finished reading Half the Sky again, um, which is a fantastic, fantastic book on um, the violence against women and oppression around the world. Um, And it they talk a lot, obviously, in statistics, um, and obviously there are a lot of statistics that are very jarring, but they talk about how the impact of one person's story versus the statistics of maybe millions of women, like you tell the story of one girl and you're likely to raise 10 times as much money as if you just talk about a general statistic of millions of girls. And it's because we we are more likely to connect with the story of one person um, because maybe there's an aspect of that story that we relate to or something that um, just hits home for us. And so, um, you know, by by there is power in storytelling, but it's, it is a tricky balance. And so that's why there is this important aspect. Like, yes, we want to tell stories, but we want to make sure that those stories are, can be shared um, and that we're not um, overstepping in any way that there, that we are um, honoring that person in the telling of their story and that we have full permission to tell that story. So um, anyway, I just think that's a really important conversation. I'm really glad that you brought it up. Yeah. And, and how can we create spaces for people to be sharing their own story um, as well? Not just having um, other people repeat it back, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, Joy, this has been so much fun. Um, but before we transition uh, or before we close out is I guess what I should say is uh, we're going to transition just a little bit um, to just ask some fun get to know you questions not that we haven't been getting to know you for the last 30 (laughs) minutes but um, but just you know some kind of lighthearted lighthearted stuff Um, so Joy are you ready for the get to know you round I am ready Ready. I'm already whipped up about ethical supply chains yes yes we're all whipped up here we go here we go um all right (laughs) question number one who would you most like to sit next to on a 10-hour flight and why Ooh, lizzo (laughs) um she's minnesotan and i love that she's just super true to true to herself and i think it would be like a really fun plane ride (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely. That is a great and really unique person. Like, because I would say half the time people say something like Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, Oprah. I'm like, you're definitely the first person to say Lizzo. So I'm here for that. I like it. I mean, also like Gloria Steinem, you know, like (laughs) that would also be cool, but it would be a less fun plane ride. Yeah, it'd be a real serious (laughs) plane ride. It'd be real serious. Sorry, Um, Gloria. Joy, what is your guilty pleasure? Ooh, ooh, <laughs> I have a lot of guilty pleasures. Um, the first thing that came to mind was just wine. <laughs> I don't know if that's the appropriate answer, but preach it, girl. Right now. The yeah, wine. <laughs> wine. Are you a red or white drinker? Red, all the way. Red, I like it. What's your favorite wine? Um, I lived in Chile for a while. Oh wow! Um, while I was developing our supply chains there, so. Um, I like a Carmenere wine, which is only from Chile, but you can find it. Mm. So you have like a real fancy uh, palette. <laughs> uh, I think sometimes I like to think so, but I probably don't yeah. <laughs> realistically. I like it. I like it. I'm here for that. Um, okay. What book or books are you reading or listening to right now? I'm currently reading Americana, um, which is fantastic and i'm listening to um becoming by michelle obama because i started reading becoming and then everybody told me that you can listen to Mm -hmm. michelle read it herself and then i'm like oh that sounds better 
Yes. I also had uh, got her book and started reading it. And then everybody was like, you have to listen to the audio book. And so I ended up getting the audio book from the library. And it's, yeah, it really is. Um, I And I think I've even talked about this on the podcast. Republican, Democrat, it does not matter. I think every person should listen to her book um, because it's fantastic. And it's just... I, I really think it's a great picture um, of her life, but also it's an important conversation around race in America, um, class in America, um, politics in America. Um, I just really think that no matter what side of the political spectrum you fall on, there's something about her story and her book that you're going to really enjoy and relate to. 100% agree. 100% agree. Yeah, my goal for this year was, because I'm a really slow reader, um, because I'm like really intense about making sure that I'm absorbing all the information as I go and don't let my brain get too distracted. Um, so my goal for the year was each month to read one book written by a feminist woman of color. And um, so I've gotten some good ones. I love Hunger by Roxanne Gay. Oh my gosh. So good. So good. Awesome. Well, I will add both of I will add all those to my list. Um, although I've already re- read Michelle's, but uh, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> anyway, okay. So my last question is a question I ask all my guests, and that is, what does it mean to you to run a business with purpose? Hmm. I feel like I should have had this answer ready because <laughs> I've heard you ask that. Um. I mean. Ultimately, running a business with purpose has just been just the biggest blessing in my life. Just that um, for me, I'm able to work through my own trauma, my own healing hand in hand with other women around the world and creating this this community of women who are investing in one another um, has just been just amazing. You know, I feel like I have sisters everywhere I go around the world, just this, just this incredible community. And it's it's really been exceptional to have had the opportunity to connect, especially with young people, I would say, um, uh, as customers, as we've continued to, to grow this organization and to watch them hold us accountable. Oh, I love it so much. It's so good. Um, but yeah, I, I know that I'm a lucky person to have found a, a purpose early on in my life, even though it was through um, unfortunate circumstances that I became quite passionate about uh, women's rights and ending violence against women. Um, but but it's led me to, to a place that I'm really grateful for. Yes. Amen. Amen. Joy, you really uh, yeah. do bring so much joy to me and to everyone that you meet. Um, and just thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for your heart and your passion. And thank you for taking time out of what I know is a busy day and a busy schedule to come chat with me for a little bit and to share your story with the Business with Purpose podcast listeners. You are a gift and I'm grateful for you. (laughs) I am grateful for you for making sure these stories are told, for helping advance this movement, for really creating a community of, what do you call them, like ethical warriors. (laughs) Um, It's fantastic and so needed. And what's supporting small brands like us, but also really what's supporting um, artisans and especially women around the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You're the best. Oh my gosh. Let's. We're just gonna have like a big old group hug right now. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Maybe some wine. Is it too early for wine? <laughs> I would love to know what you loved about this episode or something that you learned. Let me know on social media. You can find me at Still Being Molly or at Business with Purpose Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. And don't forget to use that hashtag Business with Purpose Podcast. Also, be sure to check out and shop the Seiko Designs fall collection at SeikoDesigns.com slash Molly Stillman. That's S-S-E-K-O designs.com slash molly stillman thank you so much for listening to this week's episode if you're a first time listener of the show welcome be sure to visit the archives for past shows featuring incredible entrepreneurs who are literally changing the world with their businesses and if you're a regular listener thank you for tuning in week in and week out 
Be sure to head on over to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts and click that subscribe button to help make sure that you never miss a new episode of the podcast. And while you're there, would you mind taking a moment to leave a review of the show? Leaving a review helps me to know what you're liking and how the show is personally impacting you. This episode is edited by my amazing husband and executive producer, John Stillman, with support from Kelly Dalton, and the music is by Mark Killian of Third Wheel Media. Thank you so much for listening, and go do something good with purpose on purpose. <laughs>